Crown Produce supplying select Canadian retailers. Crown Produce, proud sponsors of Canada West Football and Canadian University Countdown on Shaw. Welcome back to Crown Canadian University Countdown. I'm Andrew Wadden. This week, we take a look at a pro profile from a native son who's living the Quebec dream. Here's Ryan Sullivan. Every kid that's ever picked up a football has dreamed of becoming a star in his hometown. The story of Patrick Lavoie is just that. He stormed the CIS Laval Rouge or picked up two Vanier Cups before being drafted by his hometown, Montreal Alouettes. And it's Lavoie, touchdown! His first CFL touchdown for the rookie out of Laval! It's really nice. I can imagine uh, one year later I can, I can be here and uh, play for the Alouettes. Uh, my four, my four year with uh, Laval was really, really nice, and I can't imagine better uh, with another team. I mean, it's gonna be a really, really good thing for my career and me uh, to play for Laval and after come to uh, as the Alouette. Laval had already won three Vanier Cups since 2000 before Lavoie's arrival. He says the school's reputation on the field sparked his interest, but it was more about the potential opportunities available at the end of his school tenure that made his decision to attend that much easier. He's the number one team in the country every year, and uh, I can not choose Laval when he's recruiting. He's a, I mean, it's a big team, it's a big organization, and you know when you go to Laval, you have to, the you can make the big game at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the year, and uh, I cannot choose Laval. In his rookie campaign this season, Lavoie has racked up over 200 yards receiving and four touchdowns. With his 6'2", 240-pound frame, he's been one of Anthony Calvillo's most reliable wideouts through 10 games this year, and it's pretty clear that he'll be relied upon heavily in the stretch for the playoffs. Thanks for that, Ryan. Great stuff as always. Looking forward to having you back in the studio next week. Now it's time to go inside the CIS with this guy, Connor Hammond. And Connor, your feature this week is on a Canadian team that shocked the world at the U19 World Football Championships this summer in Austin, Texas. Well, Andrew, there were quite a few CIS connections on that roster. If you looked at the early tournament wins against the Swedes and against the Japanese, they featured the electrifying running of running back Mercer Timmis, as well as the passing combination of Will Finch of West and Doug Corby of Queens. Now, the players weren't the only connection on that squad as the head coach, Noel Thorpe, was also a coordinator at the University of Montreal for Danny Mitchell. They don't see us coming. They do not see us coming. They think this is a walk in the park for them. They're the world champions. This is their game. They do not see us coming. Well, guess what, man? We're coming. 48 minutes strong. We're coming. Get a breakdown. Let's go. We are down to two countries for a gold medal. It is the United States hosting Canada for the IFAF Under-19 World Championship game. But as the game began, it was the Canadians that struck first, racing to a 10-0 lead. And this one will be fielded and returned, and there's running room, big running room for Canada. This one's going to go to the 20, the 15, 10-5 touchdown, Team Canada. And that is Alexander Heward. How about that? A special teams touchdown. And Team Canada's on the board again. But the U.S. would strike back, making plays of their own. Well, here's a big third down play. Scott rolling. Looking over the middle. Touchdown to Marcus Ayers as he just sat down at the one-yard line. In the second half, the Canadians wasted little time seizing momentum on their first possession. Finch now, second down. Low snap, set up the screen to Amoa, looked a little surprised, but he makes the catch, breaks a tackle, breaks another tackle. Amoa's still on his feet, and he's into the end zone for a touchdown from 26 yards out. Christopher Amoa with the score. And while the U.S. would counter, the night belonged to the red and white. This is uh, basically the game on the line drive. Second down and seven. Timmis, running room into the end zone. Mercer Timmis takes it at in for the touchdown and just like that Canada with an eight point lead. Wow, Mercer Timmis who's been a big factor for them throughout this tournament. Canada was the world champion. Team Canada comes down to Austin, Texas and they take the under 19 world championship. Your final score, Canada 23, 
Hilton in a stunning gold medal game. The United States has to settle for the silver medal as you see Canada celebrate here at Berger Stadium in Austin. All right, Connor, thanks for that. Great stuff as usual. Now it's time for our final segment of the show. This is the National Roundtable. And joining me today, to my right, J.P. Schoiré from Acrofoot.com, Andrew Buckholtz nice. from Yahoo.ca, the 55-yard line blog is he's the editor of, and of course, Jim Mullen from the Canada West Game of the Week here on Shaw. Now, gentlemen, great week around the CIS, and a lot of news and notes to get to. Of course, a lot of fantastic football was played as well, but JP, I want to get to you first. What is happening in Laval in the offensive coordinator situation? Well, you know, uh, Laval has done a really good job controlling the information coming out of this situation. What they're telling us is that offensive coordinator Dwayne John, who's been uh, at the helm for two years, has stepped down from his, uh, from his OC duties to pursue his career, his, uh, career in the industrial relations. Uh, you know, obviously, this is a weird timing uh, for such a move. But, you know, the facts say otherwise. You know, the team says it's, it's him stepping down. But the facts say that right now, uh, Laval's offense is the last in the queue or next to last in the queue for most categories. So, you know, they want to dynamize their offense. And, and one way they found to, to, to be able to do that is that by having Justin Etier, the former offensive coordinator, who won four Vanny Cups with the team, uh, who was kind of around the organization working on, uh, on uh, some, the, uh, the academic side of things, just coming in and replacing Dwayne John. So the word is he stepped down, but the facts say that he got replaced. All right, Andrew, you are an alumni of Queens, Queens and Western. Sure. What a fantastic game this weekend. Maybe second best game, but we'll get into that later on. Now, you, of course, have been in the stands at Richardson mm -hmm. Stadium. What, explain what it's like. Is it is it more like an event when those two teams lock up? I mean, such a storied rivalry. Yeah, it absolutely is. Uh, Richardson Stadium can be a little bit hit and miss. Uh, when there's a big game like this against an old rival, it is absolutely nuts. And uh, viewers saw that this week, especially with the engineers storming the field at halftime. That's always interesting. But uh, yeah, at, at other times, it can feel a little empty. When it's packed like that, it's an incredible atmosphere, and that really makes it tough for the visiting team. Now, how about Queens this year? A lot of people like them. They're my sexy pick of the year right now. And uh, what do you think their chances are, though? I mean, a great win against Western, but Western's not the Western we've seen maybe years ago. This year, of course, it is Mac. What can Queens do to Mac, and can they beat them this year? Well, I'd say they certainly have a chance. I mean, to me, the OUA looks like a pretty wide open conference. And uh, the interesting thing with Queens this week was this wasn't a game that went perfectly for them. Uh, their passing offense had some good moments, but it wasn't consistently clicking necessarily. The running game was great, but they didn't go to it as much as maybe they would like to. And uh, the defense was really the only unit that played exactly as they would have liked. So if they can get top performances from all of their, all the facets of the game, that's really going to make them a tough contender. All right, Jim. And of course, you called the game here on Shaw between uh, UBC and Saskatchewan. Two different quarterbacks going head to head. Of course, a Heck Crichton Award winner going up against a red-shirted freshman. How did you uh, perceive the game between Burko and Green in the quarterback uh, playoff? Well, I think it was a game where both defenses didn't really show up. Uh, Saskatchewan did enough on defense to win the game. Billy Green playing on a leg that maybe was about 60%. And here you have a Heck Creighton Award winner at quarterback on an 0-3 team. That's kind of hard to believe. Uh, in addition to that, Drew Burko hooking up with Kit Hillis. Hillis with 14 receptions on the day. Are you kidding me? And uh, over 225 yards and three touchdowns. Uh, I think it was a big character win for the Saskatchewan Huskies. I think that they can get momentum out of this. For UBC, unfortunately, they have to face Calgary at home. I think you can mark that one down in the L column already. UBC starting 0-4 is not what Sean Olson envisioned. Okay, now that they're 0-4, or you're already calling them to be 0-4, no. that will put them at 0-12 if you add up last year and this year. Did you think that the UBC team was going to be this far in a hole at this point of the season? If they lost to Manitoba at the start of the year, my answer was yes, because that was a key game, a pivotal game that really set the tone for the rest of the Canada West season. Now you see three teams in the middle in the Canada West, Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Regina all tied at two and one and UBC being the odd man out. Uh, I think there are some good things that Sean Olson is doing with this team right now. It was very unfortunate that they lost uh, guys on their defense that were really the strength of their defense. 
and uh, I think they're paying the price for that right now. I want to get back to the uh, quarterback situation now. JP, of course, you were a quarterback in your day. There is some phenomenal quarterbacks being played right now, or, or the position being played around the CIS. Talk about uh, some of the guys that have stood out to you so far this season. Obviously, there's, there's the Quinlins, et cetera, but who's standing out to you? A lot of guys standing out for sure. Like you said, you know, Austin Kennedy out of Windsor just putting up ridiculous numbers right now, over 1,000 yards already. Uh, but two guys are just standing out of this race, and you, you named Quillen. You know, Kyle is coming in uh, from his CFL experience with the Owls, and right now he's completing 76% of his passes. He's got ATDs and no INTs, so that's just a phenomenal season so far for Cal Quinlan, who's, who's the, the head right and favorite at this point in my book. And another guy's uh, that's interesting to look at, second year pivot out of Sherbrooke, my alma mater, you know, Jeremy Rock, uh, right now 130 pass attempts, that is a lot of pass attempts after three games, but he's still completing 63% of his passes, and he's the only other quarterback that hasn't thrown an intercept interception yet. Uh, the, the thing, though, to look at for Jay Rock, last year, he had, uh, he had um, just looking at my numbers here, got sacked 13 times in the whole season, that's 30. 313 attempts, 13 sacks. This year, he's got a, a, a tier of that, but already has 13 sacks. So pass protection is an issue in Sherbrooke right now. But like you said, amazing numbers from right now, eight quarterbacks completing over 63%. So that's a big step up for the quarterback game in Canada. Andrew, same question. Yeah, I'd absolutely agree with that. And what's most impressive to me is just the sheer volume of guys really stepping up. I mean, we've got four guys averaging over 300 yards a game. Uh, we've got six guys throwing for over 280 yards a game so far. Last year, there were only two guys who did that uh, over the course of the season. And the one guy who really stands out to me is uh, Kyle Graves out at Acadia. Uh, this is another guy who got a bit of a look from the CFL last year, uh, signed with the Owls for a bit. And I, I think he's really improved coming off of that. He looks like a really dominant quarterback this year, and he's going to be a main reason why the Axemen are a threat in, in Atlantic University sport. Jim, I wanted to ask you about Billy Green. Billy Green obviously got injured in, the, in uh, week one, or excuse me, week two there. Moving forward now for Green, is, is he going to be the guy to lead these uh, T-Birds out of this hole they're in, or are they going to have to find somebody else? He's the only guy that's capable of leading the T-Birds out of this 0 for season so far. Uh, as we saw in the 6-2 and two asterisk season, uh, it was Billy Green in a number of those games putting the offense on his shoulders and willing a way for UBC to win. Not only on his shoulders, not only on his arm, but on his legs as well. He's not going to run as much with this knee injury, but he said to me, he said, look, I can deal with the pain throughout the course of the season. I've got six months to recover and go under the knife, and then I'll deal with things then. So I think Billy Green is fully committed to the rest of this season, and uh, who knows? The UBC could pull this out, but they have three of four games on the road in late October and November, and West Coast team don't do too well on the prairies at that time of year. Gentlemen, great stuff as always. I want to thank JP Schuare for joining us via Skype. Check him out on acrofoot.com. Andrew Buckholtz, yahoo.ca. He writes a blog on there called the 55 Yard Line. And of course, Jim Mullen. Catch him on Twitter, Jim underscore Mullen. Let's take a look now at the top 10 standings. McMaster reigning on top still, taking on 29 of the 30 first place votes. Calgary slipping into second there, and they have the one other vote. And take a look at Laval, who have dropped down to fourth. I'd like to thank everybody here at Crown Canadian University Countdown. Be sure to tune in next week. Good night.